last week. His funeral was yesterday in Forest Park. Uh, also, Brother Larry Fields awaiting some test results, and Mallory Chapman, uh, Gail Chapman rather, uh, anticipating possibly some further surgery. Mallory Chapman uh, has a uh, bridal shower coming up shortly, and Kendall Garner was baptized into Christ this morning. Camp Enigahi is rapidly approaching. That's two weeks from now. Silver Wings will be going out to camp on the 15th, so keep that in mind. On the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of this month, at Piedmont Road Church in Marietta, Brother Phil Sanders will be here to present a short course for the Georgia School of Preaching on Sermons of the New Testament. That's Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday morning to afternoon if you are interested in that, June the 21st through the 23rd. VBS is coming up faster than we can imagine, July the 8th through the 11th. See David Gulledge for more details. We need teachers, need helpers, and uh, need all kinds of assistance with that as usual. Do remember to keep in your prayers our upcoming mission efforts in Wisconsin in July, the 21st through the 26th, and in Scotland in the month of August. Those are all of the announcements that I have at the present time, but I do want to take the opportunity to go ahead and introduce you. If you have not met Brother Ron Brown, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He has served local congregations of the Churches of Christ for over 65 years. He has been a located preacher and minister, most recently, I guess, the involvement minister or outreach minister for the Hillsboro Congregation in Nashville, Tennessee. But for the last several years, he has worked in Southeast Asian missions, specifically in providing a refuge, a safe haven for those who are at risk of being trafficked into sexual slavery which is a very real thing in our world today. He is the founder of Save Asian Souls, sponsored by the Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee congregation. His wife, Sister Pat, of 60 odd years, has served and worked with Ron. And he has not only preached and taught and worked in uh, construction, vice president of a construction firm and various things, but he has also served local churches as both a deacon and an elder at times as well as a missionary. And he'll be speaking to us in just a moment about the work that he does. Before we get started, or as we get started, I should say, let's bow together in prayer. Eternal Father, our God, we're grateful to you for allowing us once again to gather as your children, as your people, to have this quiet and peaceful hour to exercise ourselves in worship to you. Father, we aspire that all that we do will be pleasing to you, will honor you and glorify your name, will lift us up and draw us closer to you. We pray, Father, for your strength and your energy as we go about the work of your kingdom. We ask your blessings upon our efforts as we strive to walk with you. We pray for our loved ones and brethren who are sick, those who are recuperating from surgeries and other procedures. We pray, Father, for the family of our brother Eddie Bettis as they mourn his passing into eternity, and we're grateful, Father, for his faithfulness. We're grateful, Father, and we rejoice in the birth of a new soul in your kingdom. We ask your blessing for Kendall and her family. We pray now that all that we do in our worship will honor and please you. We ask that you accept this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 790, 790. In vain, in high and holy lays, my soul a grateful voice would raise. For who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. 
wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. A joy by day, a peace by night, in storms a calm, in darkness light, in pain a palm and weak, this might is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. My hope for pardon when I call, my trust for lifting when I fall. In life and death, my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Before our prayer this evening, number 362. 362. I can only remember this song ever being sung here once on a Wednesday night a long, long time ago. Who knows the song? Good. All right. And if you don't think you know it, you've probably heard it in a movie somewhere. Okay. It's often the background music for something. We're going to sing the first and third stanzas. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of him mortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever bless, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Our prayer. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to you this evening, Father, with joyful hearts and gladness over the addition of one to our church, the young lady that was baptized this morning. We're also thankful for the five men that were added to our deacons list. We pray this evening, Father, that you will give our elders and our deacons wisdom and strength to endure as they labor. We ask you, Father, to be with our two preachers. Give them strength, health, and good memory so that they can present to us the word. We also ask you this evening, Father, to be with our military, our police, and our first responders. We ask that you keep them safe as they go in dangerous jobs to protect us. This evening, Father, we thank you especially for the gift of your son, his sacrifice, and the salvation that he has offered to us. We would ask you tonight to be with our guest speaker, give him the memory of the things he has prepared, and protect him as he labors in your vineyard. 
We ask you this evening, Father, to go with us now through the further days that we have, thanking you for all your blessings. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you would like to mark the song of encouragement following our lesson this evening, that will be number 557, 557. And before our lesson, number 632, 632, we'll sing the first and third stanzas. Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Receive ye freely, freely give from every land they call. Unless they hear, they cannot live. The gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Where sin has gone, must go his grace. The gospel is for all. I'm pleased to be with you tonight. I was thinking this afternoon, if I had to have another surgery, which I surely hope I don't, <laughs> I'm going to come back to Federal. You've been so nice, so kind, so considerate, so loving, and I appreciate it so very much. And we're self-supporting, and by you letting us park our motorhome out here, that helps. We live on Social Security. We are under the direction of the Red Bowling Springs Church of Christ, Red Bowling Springs, Tennessee, under their eldership. It's a good biblical congregation, a very loving and kind congregation, just like this one here. We enjoy working with them very much. We've been in the mission field since 1984, and we've been self-supporting missionaries most of that time. We've lived outside the United States about 15 years of the time that we've been in the mission field. We've been in several foreign mission fields. Our sick society, we live in a sick society today. And I pray for our nation every night, and I pray for the leaders of our nation every night, that something will happen to change the horrible situation which we live in today. And we're doing everything that we can in our power to save the young girls between the age of 12 and 20 who are victims of a sick society. From 19, 2016 to 2017, human trafficking in the United States increased 56.7%. That is the largest increase ever in human trafficking, and it will continue to increase as the years go on. It is very disturbing. We were in Springfield, Missouri last year, and I remember that they came on the news and on the television that the law enforcement agencies of Springfield, Missouri had raided 15 brothels in Springfield, Missouri. Well, we didn't see any signs that said brothels or anything in Springfield as we were driving around the Springfield area. But we did see a lot of signs like this one. Just like in your area, the same situation exists. You have massage parlors which serve as brothels. And many times they'll say massage parlor young Asian girls in small letters underneath. You know exactly what is happening. And they should be raided in every city. They should be put out of business because this is the source of a lot of crime in the United States. Let me give you an idea uh, of how the process works. There are recruiters from different countries that go to other countries to recruit these young girls between the age of 12 and 20. Let's take it, uh, Japan, for example. 
In Japan, there are approximately 120 to 130,000 girls in the brothels of Japan. Well, they're between the age of 12 and 20. When they get into the 20s, they don't want them anymore in the brothels, and so they have to go to other cities, and they usually go to Manila, uh, to the Philippines, because that's the cheapest place they can buy young girls. And they buy them, and they bring them back to Japan. And a recruiter will make between three hundred and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year just recruiting young girls and selling them to the source which he has. The next thing is transportation. Recently, a, a flight attendant told us about the flights between Mexico City and San Antonio, Texas. And she said she saw the same man on every flight, but he had a different girl every time he was flying to San Antonio. Eventually, from San Antonio, they end up in Houston, which is the center for human trafficking in the United States. She went to immigration and she said, this man, I see him on every flight, is bringing girls into the United States that have been flown from Asia to Mexico City. And that is the normal route that they take. Many times they can, are able to fly them directly into the United States with false documents. ISIS has been the largest producer of fake documents, but they've been put out of business and they no longer produce the documents. But their recruiters can still find the fake documents and get the girls flown into the United States. Then there's the delivery. The girls do not know that they're going to be sold into slavery, not until their passport, their fake visa, and all their identification is destroyed when they cross the Rio Grande River and come into the United States. That's the first time they realize, I am in trouble. And they are. The average lifespan after a girl is sold into slavery becomes four to seven years. If she doesn't die of a drug overdose, which they use drugs to control the girls, heroin is the major use, use drug by the Russian mafia, which is the major purchaser in the United States, many of them will overdose. Many of them will be killed. They have the highest homicide rate of any human being upon the face of this earth. And they are killed many times. How do they get into the position? We'll look at the things that cause them to become victims. You see, they're told before they leave Asia, and Bangkok, Thailand is the center point of all trafficking to the United States, to Asia, Australia, and Canada. They're told you will be in movies. You will marry a rich American and you never have to work again the rest of your life. They're told any kind of story that the recruiter can get control and get them on a flight and then sell them to his source. Sometimes it's force, it's always deception, it's always lies. We had a girl in Kathmandu that was kidnapped. He got her as far as Dubai. Dubai is the jumping off place and the distribution place to all Muslim countries, Bahrain. United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, all these rich, all rich countries will pay $35,000 per girl. So they rather sell them to the Muslim nations than any country in the world. That's what happens. That is the process. By the way, all of my charts, all of my figures are from the United Nations uh, trafficking uh, Department are from the United States Department of State. Some of them are, are merely estimates. We cannot know that, well, we know that criminals do not report their activities. If a recruiter does not have a source that is, he knows will buy the girls from him, they are auctioned off. The major auctions, and I'm sure there are others, there's one now developing in Kosovo. The major auctions around the world are Paris, France, Prague, Czechoslovakia, and Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. This is supposedly a picture of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The recruiter will bring his girls there and he is au they're auctioned off for the highest bidder. And once they are auctioned off and sold, their lives are destroyed. Now in the United States, we do not have auctions. And the FBI recently closed down the largest online 
sales market called Backstage.com. And it's, it's way past time. They should have closed them down many years ago. But in the United States, the girls were sold on Backstage.com. Also, for several years, when ISIS was in the prime of its business, ISIS would resell their slaves on Facebook. But Facebook caught up with them and cut them off. They would sell their slaves for $8,000 each, but they were destroyed when they were selling them. They had very little life left in them. The major purchasers in the United States is the Russian Mafia. The Russian Mafia goes by several other names. It's called the Jewish Mafia. It's called the Red Mafia. And the reason it's called the Jewish Mafia is because the Russian Mafia is controlled by Russian Jews. And they're very strong in 50 to 60 nations around the world. They are very shrewd. They're very smart. They come in and out of the United States without any problem. Well, how do they do that? Well, they own businesses in the United States. There's a restaurant right here in Atlanta, Georgia, that is owned by the Russian Mafia. They own three casinos in Las Vegas, Nevada. They own chains of restaurants that we may go to eat, and you can get a list of them by going to the internet and looking up the restaurants that are owned by the Russian Mafia. So they come and go and do business in the United States, and on the sideline, they handle the drugs, they handle the smuggling of girls, and they handle the prostitution. So around the world, they spend approximately $12 million per year in the purchase of, of young girls for slaves. Seven million of that 12 million is spent in the United States. The next one is the Chinese triad. They're not near as smart as the Russian mafia. The Russian mafia will take girls from Asia, like they have locations in Bangkok, Thailand, where they receive the girls from Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, all the countries that are in the Mekong River Delta area. They'll have enhancement surgeries there preparing them for the movies. They're going to be in movies. They will fly them to Buenos Aires. They will fly them to some other nation. Then they will fly them into the United States or fly them to Mexico City where they will be coming across the Rio Grande River into the United States. But they do that to confuse the FBI and the people who are trying to catch them. Now the most horrible group that I can imagine, and I don't believe this figure here of 300,000, is MS-13. I don't know if you know of MS-13 or not. It is one of the most horrible gangs. They came into California in the 1980s. They were very small at that time. They came from El Salvador. And if you have ever seen one or ever seen pictures of one, they'll have a big MS-13 tattooed on the side of their head. They'll have tattoos all over their bodies. They kidnap girls. They are operating in Atlanta, Georgia today, MS-13. How strong are they? I don't know. It's hard to keep up with exactly what they're doing. They are horrible. In order to be a member of MS-13, you must prove that you have killed another human being. That's part of the initiation of being in MS-13. If you watch Fox News, you'll see more about MS-13 than you will on any of the other channels. The others are really insignificant when it comes to the purchase of young girls for slave slavery. These are the, the areas where MS-13 is operating primarily. They have been very strong in the Long Island, New York area, and they have killed a lot of young girls in that area. They've killed a lot of people, period. And Donald Trump has sworn that he will eradicate them but the liberal, liberal, liberals of our society don't have any problem with MS-13. And that is sad, very sad. They're operating, of course, in Texas. They're operating in Central America and California, Georgia, Tennessee, North and South Carolina. And in the pink areas, they want to operate and they want to begin operation, and they probably will eventually. So we have 12 to 14-year-old girls. 36 million around the world enslaved in trafficking. 
It is a $150 billion business in 2016. 79% of all trafficking is for sexual exploitation, mostly women and girls. The only place that I have run into male uh, prostitution is in Thailand, northern Thailand. It is just expected that the young boy will go out, he will sell himself on the street in order to have the income for the family to have food to live. It is expected. They're, they don't see anything wrong with it. Eventually, when we're, we have established two safe houses in Thailand, and eventually we must face the problem of caring for young boys. Asia is the largest source of sex slaves all over the world. Why are they victims? I cannot spend a lot of time, but I will tell you organized crime, which I've already In the newspaper, an article that says, come to Paris, France, and become a famous chef. All expenses paid. And she fell for it. She went to Paris, France. She's on a second floor building. And she finally realizes, I'm not going to be a chef. I'm going to be sold into slavery. She jumps out of a second story window onto a concrete pavement. If it had not been for a gendarme standing close by, they got her to a hospital she would be dead today. Those are all over the United States. Advertisements that recruiters will run to try to capture young girls and get them into his control. Misleading friendships can be a problem. Family, the first time I ran into this was in China about 16 years ago, and that's one of the reasons that I changed from China Mission to save Asian souls. I said, I'm 81, I don't have many more years, I'm going to do something about this horrible crime. Fathers were selling their daughters for $10,000 each in southern China. And that has bothered me for many years. I have to do what I can while I can. Kidnapped, like I told you, the girl that was kidnapped in Kathmandu. One shot of Demerol, one shot of some narcotic in the neck and they just become totally unable to control themselves. And he got her on a flight from Kathmandu to Dubai, and then he was caught. Some women un unawarely will marry the recruiter, and as soon as he gets back to the country where he's from, he sells her. Poverty and gender discrimination are very major factors in trafficking. That's one of the reasons that we want every girl to learn a profession so that she can have an income, so that she can have health care. We want to convert them to the, to the church. Then she has a family. She has a family unit that loves her and cares for her. We've seen the results. We know it works. We thought we'd seen the most horrible poverty that could exist in the world in, in China. That's not true. The poverty of the Mekong River Delta area is more severe than the poverty of China. Gender discrimination in Asia is a female does not have the same value as a male. And therefore, women are abused all over this world. The abuse to the female is unbelievable. And that's just another case of it. Finally, we get to some good news. The bad news is bad enough. Our goal is to rescue girls between the age of 20, uh, 12 and 20, because after 20, they, they don't really have a market value. And to get them into a safe place, and I'll show you our safe houses, teach them the Bible every day. I had an elder from Albany go with me on the last trip that we made to, uh, to Asia. And I had him teaching some of the Bible classes. Usually I teach all the classes. We have Bible teachers, but they like to have visiting speakers come in and teach. And he said they would ask questions. These are teenage girls, 12, 14, 16 years of age. He said, I'm amazed. Their questions are so deep. He said, we don't have that in the United States. Our teenagers don't have the Bible knowledge that these girls have. And that's true, because our girls studied the Bible every day. They studied the scripture diligently. 
So once they're converted, we know conversion, they have a job, they have a family, a congregation of people that love them, recruiter, can forget it. He doesn't have a chance. Here are some of the statistics. Uh, in Nepal, we have 86 girls. 60 of the 86 girls have been baptized into Christ and are active in the church. In Laos, we have six, uh, 19 girls, and 16 of those girls have been baptized into Christ. In China, we have 18 girls, and only six have been baptized. China is still a very, very difficult country for us to operate in, even though we have worked there for 20 years. So a total of over 120 girls, and 72 of those girls have been baptized into Christ. We need sponsors. We have to have sponsors. Each girl has to have a sponsor in the United States that pays $30 a month, $360. And if you pick up one of these out front, it tells us a little story about Ganga. Ganga was eight years old when she, the first time she was sold into slavery. We have an awareness program in Nepal because in Nepal there are 20 to 30,000 girls in a country of only 29 million that are sold either to India or to the Muslim countries. And I, I hate to see them sold into either one of these countries. They are mistreated, they are abused. Ganga was sold at age eight, and then she was sold to someone else, and then she was sold to someone else, and just sold and sold. And finally, our man, who is conducting what we call awareness programs in the villages, I'll show you that if I have time, she came up to him, she said, I need help. She said, I'm a slave. And she's already got a branding, she's branded on her arm. Usually the mafia will brand them right across the chest, right across the, this, the top part of their, their chest. That means I'm a slave. I'm, a, I'm the property of this man or of this cult or this syndicate or whatever the crime group might be. She was already branded. And she'd been abused for all the years. She was baptized into Christ. She became a tailor. She has a tailor business. She is successful in her business. And she will never have to worry again about being a slave. She's now 21 years old. This is the kind of reports that go out to anyone who would happen to sponsor a girl. The forms are on the front for you if you're interested in sponsoring a girl. These are some of the girls that we have in China. Now in China, our situation is very different. We don't have safe houses. The girls live at the vocational schools where they're being trained, and most of the Chinese girls will go for medical or computer science or some technical education that requires a long period of time. We have had girls that have graduated and have jobs. But most of these girls will be uh, in the vocational school. But it saves us having to have a safe house because they're safe in the dormitories at the vocational school. These are my girls that are over 16 in Nepal. Uh, the picture was taken when I was there in February. They made their own clothing because they're learning to sew. That's their uniform for the sewing class when they go to sewing class. These are the young girls. These are girls that are 12 to 14, and they're still in a public school, and they wear uniforms. And the, the older girls that have completed the sewing training course now make the uniforms for the younger girls that you see them wearing the uniforms when they go to school. And these girls we will have for a long period of time. The girls that we, we take in that are in the 16, 17, and 18 year olds will only be in our care for approximately two years getting vocational education. But we have young girls that come in that are 16 that are in the first grade in school. And they will go to the first grade at age 16 in order to get an education. Education is important, very important. So we want these girls to stay with us five or six years, whatever it takes because any one of them could be sold for $35,000. There's a sheik in the United Arab Emirates who has 40 in his harem. And he was pocket change for him to pay $35,000 to get younger girls to be in his harem. 
So these girls are in constant danger. Give you an idea, I'm afraid that many of us as rich Americans do not understand poverty. That's a village in Nepal. That's a home in Nepal where they live. That's the inside of the house where they live in Nepal. That's another picture of the inside of the house. This is where Lokendra, my director in Nepal, is doing the awareness program. He gives out brochures in the Nepalese language that tells about what we're doing and what we will do for the girls if they come to us in need. We have 35 congregations of the Churches of Christ in Nepal with approximately 1,200 members. These ministers are our ground troops who are finding the girls in the community where he preaches. He knows everybody in the community. And he will contact Lokendra. Lokendra will go, or Ranjie, and they will fill out a complete analysis form for the girls. They will send the analysis to me. I evaluate the girl to see if they are vulnerable to a trafficker or not, and we'll take them in. That's what he's doing there in that picture. He's letting the people know. And you see the village, you see what kind of living conditions these girls are coming from. We had one girl that had lived in the forest, and she said the only food that she had to eat was the berries and the fruits that she could find on wild trees in the forest. Here are girls that are in definite danger. He's giving them the information so that they will not end up in the recruiters. There's a dormitory room in Nepal. We usually have about six to eight girls in the dormitory room where they live. That is my staff of workers. Ranje is the associate director. Lokinder on the far right is the director. Both are graduates of the Himalayan Bible Institute. It is a Church of Christ school overseen by the Commerce Church of Christ of Commerce, Georgia. And this is a picture. They live in the dormitory and have classes there. I live in a small house out to the side, which is the office up above the, the apartment of where I live when I'm in that area. And this is the Ch Nar Narayanga Church of Christ where the girls from the safe house worship. And when they come, the congregation, it looked like a female congregation, 80% <laughs> females. And the men sit on one side, the women sit on the other side. This is typical of most Asian congregations. The preacher tried to give me a hard time. I, I didn't know he was joking at first. He said, Ron, you're, you're causing my congregation a lot of problems. I, Why, I didn't want to cause problems. What's the problem? He said, every two weeks I have to go out and buy more chairs. He will continue to have problems. This is the sewing school. Now, ladies, if you were going to make a dress, I'm sure you'd go and buy a pattern. Not in Nepal. The girls have to make the patterns. So when we send them out to set up their business of tailoring, we give them a sewing machine, we give them a tape, we give them scissors, we give them a, a seamer, and that's all they have to start their business. They make their own pattern by measuring the body of the person they're going to make the clothing for. The girls down in the floor are making the patterns. The girls up on the old-timey, old-fashioned pedal sewing machines, but they have an advantage. When the electricity goes off, they keep working. <laughs> so, there is always an advantage to it. There's five baptisms in one day in Nepal. That's look, uh, Segar. He is the director of the preacher training school. The girls will come forward at, when the invitation is sung and say they want to be converted to Christ. Then they take them into a room. There could be 10 or 15 all at one time to come forward. And they discuss what they're doing, why they're doing it, and the purpose of their baptism. And then they're taken to the baptistry where they're baptized. We have a wonderful baptistry at the preacher training school where the girls are baptized. There are three more baptized. At the end of the, end of the year, we have a year-end party for the, for the girls. A very wonderful time for them. Can you imagine that you had never eaten a piece of cake can you imagine never having a party in your life? That's the situation for these girls. They never had eaten cake. They really love cake. Look at them. They're all smiling. They're all happy. We're now in Laos. This is about a 30-minute drive 
during the non-monsoon season, during the monsoon season, you may not make it there, where we have our safe house and had to make a recent addition to the safe house in order to house more girls. These are some of the Laotian girls. Now, they're, they're Asian girls, but they don't look like Koreans. They don't look like Japanese. They don't look like Chinese. They're Laotian, and they have a different appearance. And they are the most loving, sweetest girls that I have ever met in my life. And they are so receptive to the gospel, and they're just baptized as fast as they come into our group. That's one of the Bible classes, the group as they're assembled. And they are asking questions, in-depth questions about the scriptures. This is our safe house that we would be moving into. It's been under construction now for about six months. And it is in Vietnam, Laos, the capital city of, of, of Laos. Uh, Laos is a communist country, so we could not take as many girls into one location as we could in other locations. Here, this safe house, which we have constructed here, and we have a temporary safe house at the present time, will house about 20 uh, girls. Now, this is the girls in Laos, and you see the embroidery out front. I bring the embroidery back and let people take it at the congregations and put a donation in for the piece that they take. And I send the money back to the girls because this is eventually going to be their income. This is how they'll make a living. And it is put on garments, it's put on uh, around the, the wrist of a coat at a very formal occasion by the La Laotian government for borrow wedding and di different occasions. This is the baptistry that located between the church building and the uh, safe house. Now, this is what I did on the last trip. I have a five-year plan, and I gave every one of the elders a copy of the five-year plan. My plan was to have two safe houses in Thailand after we had China, Laos, and Nepal. So I could not find property, except I found one piece of property. And it's an amazing story how God works is just sometimes just blows my mind. We were out looking for property in Makadan, uh, Thailand, and it was very expensive. All the property was in the range of a quarter of a million dollars, U.S. dollars, to buy a piece of property to build a safe house. So we'd been looking all day. We finally came into the afternoon. We, we knew about some property at a location that was close to a main highway. We went by to look at it, and it was a pretty good site. And the man said, I don't own this property. It's owned by my sister, and she lives in Bangkok. But she's willing to give you a piece of property for the church. I guess I could have fainted. She gave us property that is valued at 250,000 U.S. dollars. I'll never forget it. It's just unbelievable. But with God, nothing is impossible. But I do have a temporary safe house, which has never been lived in. We rented it for $325 a month. It'll house 26 girls, and that's it on the left. Then down at Songala, which is way southern part of Thailand, I found another building. It was a commercial building, but we can house 60 girls in that building, and eventually, hopefully, we can find some property to build on down in that area. Now, this is the, the, the large commercial building where we can house 60 girls, and these are the beds, the bunk beds that I've already purchased. They're installed, already got the dining room set up, already got the kitchen ready. Uh, it's quite a task to cook for this many girls. And I have the, already employed a couple. She's a nurse. He's an engineer. They came from northern Thailand, moved down to Sangala in order to be the house parents for this particular location. We continue to do open heart surgeries. I started this in China many years ago in cleft palate surgery. We've done over 1,000 cleft palate surgeries. This is not the latest. We have a little child right now at Children's Hospital in New Orleans that just had open heart surgery that will be flying back to China on the 6th. But this is one that we did at uh, Le Bonheur Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. You see the family where they lived, very poor. If we don't do the open heart surgery for these children, they die. 
Some areas of China, 90% of all the children will die with congenital heart disease because they do not have the surgery. So we will continue to do as many open heart surgeries as possible to save the lives. That's Jackie Fong. I baptized Jackie down in southern China, in Guilin, China to be specific, in 2004. It wasn't long after that that Jackie went to work for me. He worked for me in China for 10 years. Then he went to Four Seas Bible School in Singapore. Then he came to the United States, and he's been at the Memphis School of Preaching now for two years. He will graduate on the 15th. He will meet me in Florence, Alabama, and we start planning, and I want him to fill these shoes that I have on. And he can. He's worked for me for 10 years. I'm 81 years old. Jackie was born in 1980. Wow, he's young. He's just a kid. But I want him to take my place. I don't ever plan to retire. In fact, someone asked me not long ago, are you, when are you going to retire? I said, well, on the day of my funeral, if it's in the afternoon, I hope I can work a half a day. <laughs> I may be a little op optimistic after this surgery. A <laughs> hundred years from now, it will not matter how what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or the car I drove. But the lives and souls of young girls may be saved because we were important in saving them from a horrible death and the loss of their souls. I can't tell you everything that I know about human trafficking because it's not, a, not appropriate to tell in the audience tonight. But you should read about it and study it because it's happening right in your neighborhood, all around you. And the lives and souls of girls are being destroyed, and they can be saved. So our goal is to save their lives and save their souls. And we've been able to do that successfully. Thank you for loving and caring, and thank you for letting us stay out back and live here for the period of time. I will definitely keep you in my prayers and remember you. Now, I did prepare a sermon, <laughs> but I promise we'll be out by 8 o'clock. <laughs> okay, I'm sure I have your attention now. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 is about 3,000 were added to the church. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 says the number's up to 5,000. Oh, my, the church is growing. Acts chapter 5, after the incident with Ananias and Sapphira, it says that women and men, that first number did not include women, possibly, because it says men. But there in Acts chapter 5, it says women and men were being baptized into Christ. The next scripture is found over in Acts chapter 6, in verse 14 where it says the, the group is growing larger and larger. Oh, that's, that sounds good. Then in Acts chapter 8, it says, and they went down and they established the church down in Samaria, just as the, exactly the way the Lord intended for the church to be spread is being spread. We come along, we read it further in the book of Acts, and again, they use about the same expression in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, more and more are being converted to the cause of Christ, and the church is growing, is growing very rapidly. And then in Acts chapter 11, they send up to Antioch. Antioch was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, and the church is established at Antioch. And it grew to be a very large congregation and one of the important congregations of the Lord's church during that time. We come along to Acts chapter 13, and Paul and Silas are sent out by the church at Antioch to go on the first missionary journey. And we don't know how many were converted, but we know that something like 56 congregations of the Lord's church were established during Paul's missionary journey. A lot of congregations. They may have been small, and they may have grown large, like the Church of Smyrna was a large congregation. Many others were large. Corinth was a large one. Uh, Rome was a large congregation. The churches of Christ are decreasing today. 
we have lost about 500,000 adherents in the Lord's church in the last 10 years. Now look what was happening in the New Testament. What has happened in the New Testament that has changed that we are declining today and the New Testament church was growing at a rapid pace? Something has happened. Something has gone wrong. When I graduated from high school in 1955, the Churches of Christ were the fastest growing religion in the United States. And it continued even into the early 70s that the Churches of Christ were the fastest growing. We need to go back and we need to study. So I want to challenge you tonight. Go back and read the New Testament scriptures and see what they did that's different from what we're doing today because it is not working today. If you want this church to grow, you have to be actively teaching God's word. They were out teaching every day. And I remember in, 1950, in the 1950s, every night that I had an opportunity, I was at the Hillsborough Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee. We were out with the Jewel Miller film strips. And all you had to do was press the button when the bell rings and go to the next slide. Now it's a lot simpler now. But we converted people to Christ. Large numbers of people were converted. But we're not busy, we're not active. And when the apostles were arrested and they brought before the Sanhedrin and they said, don't be preaching, don't be teaching in the name of Jesus anymore, what did they say? We cannot but help preach and teach what we know. And when we start doing the very same thing, the church will grow again. The churches of Christ in Thailand and Laos, Nepal, and those countries are growing, and the center of Christianity will move from Africa to Asia within the next 10 years. We have to get the churches growing again, and we are the ones that are going to do it. There are many that are not here this, tonight. They're not going to be involved, probably. Not some of them couldn't come. They're providentially hindered from coming at night. You are the ones who will be determining whether this church will grow or not grow in the future. God wants everyone to be saved. And God has given us the instructions, the know-how, the ability, and the tools to spread his gospel. Let's go back and grow like the New Testament church grew. The Roman Empire was of 181 million people. That was all of the Roman Empire. Well, how many of those were Christians? Based on the figures that we find in the New Testament, based on secular history, there was approximately one million Christians. One million. In 32 years, the New Testament Christians had baptized and converted a million people, approximately. Now, the figure varies depending on which source you read. Some say 500,000, some say 2 million, but I think the, the figure of one million is close. What can we do in the next 32 years? Can we win a million people to Christ? Not if we sit on our seats. Not if we sit at home at night and watch television. Only if we're out and involved, to house to house, preaching and teaching God's word. If you're not enrolled in the army of God and if you're not a servant of God, and I like that scripture, Philippians 1 and 1. Paul and Timothy, slaves, I like, of Jesus Christ. If you're not a slave for Jesus Christ, you need to be, and you need to come tonight and be baptized just like our little sister in Christ was baptized this morning. Or if you need the prayers of the congregation, would you come? While together we stand and sing for your encouragement. Let me hide myself in thee, let the water have
and the flood. From thy riven side which flowed, be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my seal no rest but no? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, vile I to the fountain fly, wash me save your whole There are likely some present this evening who have not had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper today. It's been left prepared for you. If you'll come to the front pews as we sing the next song, you will be served then. Number 293. Number 293. We've sung this a time or two in the past. We're going to sing the first verse, then the second verse, and then we'll sing the chorus at the very end. Just follow the slides. My life, my love, I give to thee, thou Lamb of God, who died for me.
We're so thankful for the presentation you've given us tonight that reveals to us the efforts that are taking place to first rescue lives and then rescuing souls. We're thankful for everyone's presence tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're really glad that you're here. Feel free to come back any opportunity that you have. We want to remember all the events of this week, which I can never remember, so I'm not even going to attempt. Just look in the bulletin uh, to see when you need to be here. Wednesday night, of course, for Bible study, and then back again uh, next Sunday for Bible study and worship. As we prepare to dismiss this evening, let's stand together. We'll sing number 572. We're going to sing the first and third stanzas. There's a call comes ringing for the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Father, for the sunshine today. We pray, Father, for the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Father, for waking us up today to come to this beautiful building to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, whatever was said here today, it was well received by each and every one of us here, Father. We pray, Father, for the elders of this congregation. We pray for the deacons, Father. We pray that whatever decisions that they make will be able to uplift your kingdom. We pray also, Father, for the mission that is going on out in the world, Father. We pray for the effort of these preachers and missionaries we pray, Father, that whatever help that they need, they will receive. We pray, Father, for the sick and the short ends, especially those among us. We pray, Father, that you will restore them back into their desired health. We pray, Father, for those who are grieving at this time, we ask you to comfort them. Father, as we are born to depart from this place, but never from your parents present, we pray that you will always be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>